Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, beginning with verse 1, after all the talk of how well you've done, the Bible starts with, Oh, you foolish Galatians. At least you're not Galatians, are you? Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? O foolish Galatians. The Apostle Paul had been used by God to take the gospel to these and to others. He took God's truth made available by and through Jesus Christ to these folks. And Paul was especially called to the Gentiles. Those not connected to the Jews in the past. Those not familiar oftentimes with God's truth. We would say to the lost and he established churches among them. Mission, he was a true missionary. This was not a specific city. It was a region like a county or state where he had established many churches. It's in the area where modern day Turkey is, if anybody cares about that, if you know your geography. And Paul had been instrumental in establishing local churches. That's God's chosen method of grounding people in the gospel message so that they can abide in Christ by faith, so that they can spread the truth in their own homes, in their own communities and beyond. The local church is God's method. Whether we're talking about missionaries overseas or we're talking about here in America or just where we are, that's what it is. It's building churches. It's establishing local churches. Sometimes you have to go in and learn the culture and learn the language and all of those things. And we support those missionaries and we're thankful for Bible translators and all the pieces and parts that go into it. But the, the objective is to make local churches. That's where it happens. That's where everything good for God happens. And I'm so thankful that you support your local church. And as a local church matures, then it can begin to go outside of itself and start beginning to do things like what John David's asking you to participate in, what Georgie's doing, what others are doing, uh, the ladies retreat, reaching out to other people. I'm so thankful that you're a part of it. And you're part in a denomination that exists to lead and to supply local churches of, is of greatest importance to God. Great missionary field. Whether we're talking about local or abroad, it's a great effort. Your giving here when done according to God's blueprint pays eternal dividends. But how we give and why we work and why we do what we do is at issue here. And how we are right with God is at issue in these scriptures. The apostle had set forth among them how God's plan works how we are right with God and how He motivates from that platform all that He needs to accomplish. God through Paul had established how the gospel works. It's not by the flesh. He makes that very clear. It's not by human effort apart from God. We can't do it in our flesh. We've got to have God motivating. We've got to have God making it happen or we are Pointless. We are failures. God through Paul had established how that gospel works. It's not by the flesh, not by human effort apart from God's direct leading and supplying. It is by God's grace. It's His work. It's by His support applied automatically and fully when we respond by faith. Faith, trust, that comes, you hear it over and over again, but it's so important, comes by hearing the Word of God. That's why one of the most noble endeavors that this local church and every local church strives to do is set somebody free to study God's Word, learn the Word of God, and teach the people God's Word. Help them learn. Be an instrument, a tool, a support. 
Faith, trust that comes by hearing the Word of God. At issue here in Galatians was how God gets His work done in us. It is the work of God preparing us for His eternal home. And yeah, He wants to use us along the way, uh, being instrumental in other people in that pathway, that journey. But this is what it's all about. He's getting, re- getting re- us ready to live with Him for all of eternity. When Jesus comes into us by our initial step of faith, He forgives every sin. But because of sin, He comes into a mess. He comes into a wrecked place, doesn't He? This world is a wrecked place. When we bring our lives to Him, sin has had its awful effects on every single one of us without exception. And we bring Him a mess. How to perform, how to please has been formed by this environment. How we please. What motivates us has been all formed by this fallen, sinful world. We have How to perform, how to please has been warped by sin and the resulting ignorance in our world. Most of you have heard one of my favorite illustrations. I'll use it. I'll beat it to death because I love it so much. But HGTV, y'all have heard my illustration about HGTV. I love watching those shows because I love seeing an old, dilapidated, uh, termite-ridden, the wiring has gone wrong. Sometimes they find that out during the show. You know, they have to have the drama of the show. The plumbing is bad. They have all of that stuff that's gone wrong. And I love to see the transformation. You know, the moment that somebody who's going to transform that house uh, becomes the owner of that house, everything is new all of a sudden. New plans, new hopes, new designs. But you know, when they step into that house, they may be the new owner, but the house is still a mess, isn't it? That's the same thing that happens when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Bad wiring, bad plumbing, the roof leaks, termites have eaten the wood. Uh, It is a wreck because sin has had its effects in our world. And so all we do is we, we hand the deed over to the Lord Jesus Christ, the master, the one who can renovate your life and make it into what it ought to be. A new owner. And we love to watch it, don't we? It's one of the ways we relax as we watch HGTV. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man, I've underlined the word any, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become there. A new honor with a wonderful plan. It's a radical change, but you'll notice our bodies don't change, do they, when we receive Christ? The Bible says our outward man is still perishing. We're still getting old. We still have all the problems that our old bodies have, but God is using all that experience in this life as He renews our spirits. Become a Christian old age isn't something to be afraid of. You know, I know it's not fun, but it's something to be embraced because God's going to use even that in our lives, in the renewing of our spirits, making us into the people He needs us to be for all of eternity. It's an adventure. The inward man is renewed day by day. If you need to know where that is, it's in 2 Corinthians 4.16. God is renovating us spiritually. It affects our emotions. It impacts our outward appearance often. All of you have been around me very long, and I have. if Nate's around, I always say, pull out that old driver's license picture of you when you weren't a Christian. And no, God doesn't uh, make us look any different, except He may change our priorities. He may change how we dress. He may change a lot of things by internal change. And in, inside, He gives us new attitudes and new reasons. And it it is reflected in our emotions. It's reflected in how we carry ourselves. Because now we live with an awareness that our bodies are the temple of God. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. All things are new. In that sense. Don't look for 
an 18-year-old face when you look in the mirror if you've received Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, there's a new perspective. Everything's new. Even this 60-year-old face can be new in Christ. What makes all things new? He does. Now we listen to Him. He's the new owner. He's the director. The one who spoke to you by truth now leads you by truth by His Spirit. The more of His truth we know, the more of those repairs that are being made. Remember, we just give, we give Him the keys and the title, don't we? <laughs> We're still a mess, but His truth is changing us. You know what, God, the only thing He asks of you, listen to my truth. That's all He asks. He said, I'll accomplish everything that needs to be done. You rest. You rest in me. Allow me to teach you and I'll do all the changes that need to be made. I'll make the want-tos happen in your heart and in your life. Naturally affecting the outside. The law, on the other hand, has nothing to do with changing the inside. It simply applies pressure to the outside. The law demands that we do the work. Y'all have heard me quote my dad before. He said, son, don't drive the people. That's what the law does. Drives the people. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You should do better. You should give more. You should attend better. You should be available more. That's the law. Come on, people. My dad told about a preacher that said, we're not starting this service till you all move to the front. And he stood there and nobody moved. And he said, you fool, if they'll hang from the rafters, you ought to preach the gospel to them. He was a good friend. He could call him a fool. <laughs> Don't drive the people. You know what he said? Love the people. Feed the people and love the people. My dad had some wisdom, didn't he? I love the simple rhetorical question here in Galatians 3.2. This, this is all I want to know. This is all I would learn of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He says, answer that question, people. He knew. He was the one that brought the gospel to him. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit that now you think you'll be made perfect in the flesh. God forbid. There were those coming in trying to impose the law, the Old Testament law on them. I love the question. Are you going to be made perfect? The Greek word epitelio, to bring to completion, to be finished, to be ready to live inside of God's wonderful, restored, glorious creation forever. Do you think that's going to be done by the law? If you started in the spirit, how do you think the rest is going to be done? You listen to me. You listen to God, his truth. Best thing you can do for your life and your family is to listen to God's truth. That's some of what we're going to talk about as men Thursday night. No pressure. It can be just a little morsel. We're going to talk about God's truth, I'm sure. I'm not in charge of it. I'm glad. Bring to completion. Unveil the finished product. See the end of the HGTV show and go, Wow! In this case, you can say, oh, my God. Like everybody does for no good reason. But this time, when God unveils what he has accomplished, we can say, oh, my God. Oh, my God, what you have done. What you have accomplished. The work of God has only begun when you surrender to Jesus Christ. It started with the truth. You heard it. You believed it. You didn't do anything else. And it continues that way. And our will is by God's design. Our will being involved is by God's design and purpose, an essential ingredient from day one and throughout the renovation. It's our will is involved. He said, you started that way, continue that way. 
That is why the apostle was so moved with concern and and where we read in verse one, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you? Who's changed you? That's the only way you can be derailed from this process. That somebody has caused you that you should not obey the truth. That's what verse one says. It's the only way you can be gotten off track for you not to obey the truth. Who has done that? Who has caused you to think that you don't have to obey the truth? That you leave the process of truth being active in your life by your obedience to the truth, hearing and believing. Who has caused you to go elsewhere? Or to think it's by any other way but by the truth. These had seen Jesus crucified. They weren't there physically. They didn't see him with with their eyes. He says, you've seen Jesus crucified. That means they had by faith seen it for themselves. Christ was crucified. And you know it. And you saw it and you believed it. Now, who's gotten you off track? If you started with truth and faith, why have you gotten off track? Why now do you believe it has something to do with the law? God help us. And then he says in verse four, have you suffered so many things in vain? If it yet be in vain. You know what? They suffered greatly when they became Christians. They were persecuted. They were in trouble for being Christians. He said, you went through all of that for nothing? If now you're getting the process done by works, it's for nothing. It's only by faith. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory, in other words, if you hold on to it, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Somebody can make you think you're saved by any other way. God help us. God help us. Then your salvation is in vain. Then what you have done in the past is in vain. No ultimate end. No final salvation. That which God is planning and working and doing simply by your cooperation is not going to be accomplished. This is serious business. (laughs) What Paul is dealing with. Look at Galatians 5. I know we have a conference, so I'm going to wrap it up soon. Galatians 5, beginning with verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You go under the old ceremonial law and get yourself under that, then Christ does you no good. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. If you're going to do it that way, then you have to do it all that way. Can't have part. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. This is this couldn't be any more important, could it? Who has deceived you that you would go another way? Let me tell you... Uh, I'm going to take my dad's advice. I'm going to let God, the Holy Spirit, teach you truth and allow him to change you from the inside. Change the way you look at things. Change your priorities and see what happens. See what happens when you see that person who doesn't know Christ and you realize they're going to go to hell without the gospel. How is that going to change you? It'll motivate you on it. Motivate you. Not for guilt. Law law's what bullies and makes you feel guilty and all of that. No, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're in a union with Him, He makes it a joyful experience. 
I tell you, as far as, as long as I'm pastor of this church, we are not going to operate by law, by outward pressure, by making people feel guilty if they're not giving or coming or doing any of those things. We may be disappointed from time to time. Preaching to John David, aren't I? <laughs> Keep looking at him for a reason. We all need these things. Those who might be in ministry need these things. We're not going to be legalistic. And you may have been raised by a legalistic parent. You know what? They can never be pleased. And if you were raised by a legalistic parent or church, they can never be pleased and you feel guilty all the time and you never feel worth anything. If you were raised by a, a, a liberal parent, then you don't even think there's a standard and you think the whole world revolves around you. If you were raised by the Lord Jesus Christ, you know He's going to take care of everything if you just listen to Him. Son, if you just listen to me, you don't have any problems. I'll take care of you. I'm thankful that that was largely the kind of home I lived in. Thankful for that because it set me up to believe this glorious gospel. I want us to sing an invitation hymn.